Um, all right. So you were born and raised in Conway. Indeed. And the uh, and um, so tell me um, what your life was like growing up. Uh, were you a bookworm? Were you athletic? Were you some magical combination of those two? What, were, what was that like? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I'd say ni neither, if I can say neither. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I... Um, it, yeah, it's funny. I, I think that... I mean, I was a I was a, a piddler. I dabbled in I, okay, <laughs> I dabbled yeah. in both, but I think that I you know in terms of in terms of being a bookworm, I think that that probably came later. I think early on, I was very interested in movies. I wanted to be an actor. I was very interested in comedy. I was interested in. Uh, kind of obsessed with stand-up at the time really? for okay. some reason. And then, uh, yeah, I think that... Um, were, you, were you in school plays, or did you... Did you yeah, I was in, I was in uh, plays growing up, and then plays at the Rep here, and then, uh, you know, the Art Center before that, and things like that. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I did, that whole, did that whole run, and I really, I, I, I really wanted to be an actor. I, um, I mean, I, I, I was a reader. I just had a... I guess an issue with authority <laughs> that I didn't want to read whatever you know they were right. telling me to read in school so I wasn't a particularly strong student and um, I went to college for a year and then I moved out to LA when I was 19 to act and um, uh, it turns out that they had enough actors out there they didn't need they didn't need me so um, okay. I uh, but I mean through that experience I actually um, it was it was in that in that year out there that things actually went okay and i saw enough that i didn't want my path <laughs> to be an actor and part of that was taking uh, improv and sketch classes and things oh, really? like that and okay. really my i'd written uh, you know a little bit but um it was writing sketch comedy that started me oh, writing. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. Tell, um, let me let me back up a little bit. So, what what did your uh, mother and father do? And um, well, my dad was my dad was a uh, was a doctor in Conway, and he was he was in his fifties when he had me. He had a whole first family, and um, he was sort of you know at the time Conway was really small he was I think one of three doctors and so he was one of those one of those kind of country doctors that I think he delivered 4,000 babies in his, in his time there so uh, my entire youth was spent going to Walmart and people coming up to me and saying you know your your daddy delivered me and me <laughs> saying yeah I, I know <laughs> because we're in Conway so um, so yeah they, and then my mom was a uh, um, she retired a couple of years ago. She was a history professor at UCA and uh, kind of s specialized in civil rights era history and then teaching teachers. Okay. So, yeah. so how did the um, how did you get to New York University and how did uh, how did that come about? Well, when I was in um, when I came I when I was in Los Angeles, I kind of made the decision that I did want to, uh, f you know, finish my degree. So I went, came back to UCA, and that's when I s actually really devoted myself <laughs> to my studies, kind of <laughs> for the first time in my life. And, um, and I, I was a theater minor, and then my majors were English and philosophy, and I was going to pursue uh, academic philosophy. That's what I, I was applying to graduate schools for that. And then uh, my philosophy advisor said, if you can do anything else, you should do it. <laughs> and, um, and I had written part, part of the, the beginnings of writing uh, sketch in, in LA led me when I came back to start writing plays. I mean, I remember when I had Terry Wright and he sent you my first one act that I ever, yeah, that's right. I ever you know, I ever wrote. And, um, and you were, you know, I, I, 
very kind to <laughs> to read that and 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 you know and and give well, notes and all that. But it was yeah. Well, I mean, this is part of the payment back. And <laughs> we'll we'll figure out the rest. Um, so. But in did you uh, did you apply to a whole lot of schools? Did you? I, I applied. I well, I'd applied to three grad schools for philosophy, and then I said, he said, he said you should. He said really, and he'd seen the a uh, couple of plays that I'd written because we did productions of them at UCA, and he said. Uh, you should apply for playwriting if you really have interest in that. So I applied to four schools for that as well. And um, when I got into that, I, uh, I got into NYU, I, I sort of took his advice and, and ended up doing that. So, um, yeah. All right. So you were um, so graduate school in New York City mm -hmm. in playwriting. In 2001. 2000. Per perfect time to move to New York, right? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, seriously, August? Or uh, seriously, yeah. September? Yeah. No. You, um, well, I moved up early, so I moved up in May. Wow. As soon as I finished school. Okay. So, yeah. And spent the summer up there. So, yeah, that was the um, uh, my first semester in school. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Didn't know it's that. pretty wild. Um, so, the in terms of trying to right in New York City or being graduate school in New York City did that was that a challenge was it exciting was it I mean I was terrified <laughs> I mean and even even coming from even having lived in Los Angeles for a year there was something about because um, I hadn't spent that much time in New York so uh, my main exposure to New York other than touristy things was this idea of like mean streets taxi driver right you know and and my mom and dad that was their impression of new york as well <laughs> so um so i i went there and uh it was funny because i'd made a friend I'd, I'd done a, a a little playwriting apprenticeship thing that was at um uh, vassar the summer before I moved to uh, this, the summer before the summer that I moved to New York, and I had made a friend there who was an actor, and we were both broke, but he was born and raised in New York, and he was like, "I'm going to find us a place," and I said, "That's great. I don't know anything about New York," and he found us the worst apartment <laughs> in the in the worst possible neighborhood in Crown Heights. Was it was it which the was one known with, for its riots? Was it the one yeah. with the bathtub in the kitchen? It was. Um, no, it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't, we didn't have to bathe in front of each other, but other than that, it was pretty, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty rough. And, um, and what was even worse was that his acting career sort of immediately took off at that point, because he got a, he got a part on Sex and the City, and then he got, that led to him getting a role on Friends. I feel like I'm talking about the 19th century, right? <laughs> but you got, you got a part on Friends. Not to date they myself. Still, they still show reruns of Friends. Yeah, so they do. So. They do. Yeah, they're still it's still available on television sets. Um, but uh, yeah, so he he was basically started his career started taking off, and he he was in Los Angeles the entire time. So I was the one person that I knew in New York was gone. So yeah, so that was it was a it was a rough uh, it was a rough baptism, but yeah. 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 So all right, so and you've got really wonderful credits in your bi biography that are playwriting credits. And so you graduated from New York University and then, so you were in New York working as a playwright, right? Or, I yeah, mean, I mean, to, I mean to, to whatever degree you can say that someone works as a playwright. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, you know, I, I had a, I worked, I worked for, my, I worked for, I was writing plays, and then I was also working for another playwright, uh, who's a guy named Frank Pugliese, who is a, um, uh, was sort of a writing mentor to me, and um, you know, is, he works on House of Cards now. But he was, um, I worked for him during that time, and then I was just writing plays, and uh, you know, I I was 
had $150,000 of student loan debt and was making $10 an hour working for him and writing plays. So it was pretty... Uh, and, it, and, and living was, in Crown Heights. And, and living in Crown Heights. So it was lean times. But I... Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, thankfully that time was a really productive period for writing. I mean, yeah. the one thing that I, I, I'll say that, you know, in, NYU absolutely did for me was taught me to write on deadlines. And it gave me two years to do nothing but, but write and kind of explore that because um, it, I don't know that I, it, whatever the opposite of a polymath is, I, it wasn't that I, I just didn't know what I wanted to do. <laughs> and I think that having the focus of, of that of, of a program that, that was completely immersive was very helpful for me. So, um, yeah, and, and, and thankfully I got some good readings and workshops and a couple of productions and stuff during that time, and that was, that was all great. So, all right, now we'll go to the part about how, how did Love Guru come about? Well, I had a I had a production of a play and a friend. Uh, well, I mean, this this uh, this woman I knew who was a, a manager. She wasn't my manager, but she was friends with Mike Myers, and and he had came to the play with her. And um, I met him afterwards, and we talked for a little bit. And then the next day, uh, his wife, uh, Mike's wife at the time, called me and said, "Hey." Uh, there's a guy named Michael McCullers who had written Austin Powers movies with him, and um, she she basically said, it, you know, McCullers is no longer working for Mike. He's looking for somebody to come in in a creative capacity to be sort of a you know a writing assistant slash you know if it moves into co-writing type thing. So um, so I I. I gave up that ten dollar an hour job, <laughs> and I and you know I went to to work for him, and I w ended up working for him for for five. I mean, I I didn't realize that I was going into um, working for him like right as his sort of midlife crisis struck. <laughs> So there, there were some, there were some unproductive. Well, we, we, there were some false starts insofar as you know, we wrote a couple of screenplays together that were smaller and that he was going to do, and then he kind of ended up balking at, and then um, things like that. So yeah, but I ended up working for him for for five years, and and that was the culmination of it. Yeah. Right. And so, and Love Guru came out two thousand and eight. Is that right? Eight. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It has been long. Can you? Looking back on it now, can you can you talk about that experience of having it come out? I mean, that's a that's a major a major movie, and thousands of screens across the country. Was it? I imagine it must be a pretty heady experience. Yeah, it, I mean, it was. I I mean, I think I'd put a lot of hope <laughs> into sure. that pro and 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 a lot of sort of sweat equity, which is a term that I really don't like, but I'm going to use because I can't think of anything else at the moment. But, you know, I put a lot of time in, into, into working for him and on that project. We did a stage play of it beforehand in the East Village that we did oh, wow. for a while, which was, yeah, it, and, and sort of the distinction between what it started as and what it became and all that. And so when it came out, you know, it was it was not successful either critically or or financially. So I thought that what was going to be a a boon for me, and because <clears throat> I'd gone to New York to be a, you know, a, a, that that's where where life seemed to be leading me was to write plays, and that's what I wanted to do. And I always loved movies, but I didn't really aspire to right. to write movies. But the you know, there's there's seems to be a consistent theme of playwrights who are successful before they're 30 or so, and that's that they come from really wealthy families. <laughs> so they spend their entire 20s, right. you know, writing, writing plays. And then, but, you know, when you accrue a hundred and some thousand dollars worth of student loan yeah. debt, you know, you, you, you sort of take that job. And, and, um, and I, you know, I don't mean to, for that to sound like a, an apology for it at all, I, it, or for moving into the field. It's just the, I think that that's sort of a, 
a crucible that every aspiring writer has to come to, and that's that are you going to try to make your peace with with you know art versus commerce you know are you going to make your peace with that or or continue to kind of rail against it or are you going to try to are you going to try to do what you feel is artful within that system or are you going to try to work outside of it or are you going to try to do both and um, <clears throat> so that's you know that that was a big a big question at that time for me and not a not an easy decision to make but you know it it's uh, at a at a certain point I got so far down the road that I think you know there was no turning back <laughs> well right I mean you know I mean play playwrights routinely today don't you know that you'd ask any ask any playwright the, of of note in the United States they're all working in film I mean Tony Kushner and you can just go on and on my most successful year I made seven thousand dollars as a player <laughs> right right, yeah. right yeah so yeah, yeah. um so Love Guru happened 2008, and was there at some point in there where you like said, okay, I've got it, you're moving back, you move back to, and you move back to. I did, yeah, right after that. And part of that was the, the anticipation that I would be able to, you know, that, that I would, um, I'd been in New York for eight, almost nine years, um, and I, I didn't want to go to Los Angeles. I, I called my agent and he said, I said, hey, I'm thinking about moving. And he said, great, you're going to move to L.A. And I said, no, I'm going to move to Arkansas. <laughs> and he, I said, does that matter? And he said, well, you haven't had a meeting in New York this entire time. So if you don't live in Los Angeles, I don't care where you live, <laughs> live wherever you want to. It's still about taking a flight, you know, to get here. So, um, you know, so much of the industry is, is just centered centered there and it's obviously becoming more of an opportunity to, to work elsewhere but you know it's still centered out there so <clears throat> so and in post love guru it's also 2008 start we slide in the recession and that I, I know I talked to you before that about that that was there was there a point after the love guru that you thought okay maybe I'm not gonna be doing this or yeah I mean I I, I think there, there was a, t a time of sort of wandering in the desert there for a while that felt, I mean, professionally and financially and otherwise. I mean, and we, were, you know, my wife and I had a baby. We moved back here, and um, it was really a, it was, it was hard because I was trying to, like, I came, I moved back here. I immediately wrote a play. <laughs> <laughs> and then I wrote sort of a small character comedy as a screenplay and then I sent that out and my representative said this is great and five years ago we would have sold this for a lot of money but it's not the same industry anymore and so oh. in that in that sort of post recession time you know it was um, I think there was at one point between like I, I want to say 2000 12 and 13 maybe 2011 2012 where I think the number of movies that studios put out went from being 82 to 34 <laughs> and so you know and and as you guys can see from from what's in movie theaters now it's just it's either it's either movies over a hundred million dollars or typically under a million and that's what what people are making yeah. so um, so yeah that that was that was Tough. So I and and so I, I think from the experience and working with Mike, what I realized I wanted to do more character-based stuff. I wanted to get back to why I got into writing, and then I was watching these dramas on on TV, and that you know it was also a. I, the time that I was in grad school was when The Sopranos was sort of at its height, and then right. after that, it was just like, okay, well, what about moving into that? So that's that's when we, you know, sort of moved into that and started to find some a little success. So, and and there, and around this time, you were also you'd also met Ray McKinnon. Yeah, um, we let's see, I. 
the War Eagle Arkansas, which was a small feature that um, was made here in Arkansas, was in the at the I think the second Little Rock Film Festival, if I'm not mistaken. And I came <coughs> to that, and I was on a panel with Ray and uh, Jeff Nichols, and. We were talking afterward. I, I, I think I'd met Ray once before, but and he's and I, I guess we need to. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, context. Yes, and he is an he's an actor. He was in the he Deadwood. Was in, he was in Deadwood, and he's 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 um, he was the sort of the preacher who you know gradually spins out on Deadwood, and then he was um, like he's he was in the Blind Co Side. Coach, I was yeah, about to say, yeah. I think maybe you know, that's yeah. got to be his most uh, recognizable. Most yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but he's also a, a, a writer and a really great uh, filmmaker. And and so we were on this panel together, and we started talking about. Um, afterwards, we were talking, and I think we just started talking about like southern characters because a lot of the focus of it was you know sort of southern films and um and we were i don't know we were just like cracking each other up about stuff and then we he had this idea of doing a he said he'd always wanted to do kind of like a a half hour like sketch show based entirely in the south and then I started talking about I'd seen an example they do these things in southern Italy of that are very regionally specific but but comedy and they're just sort of these series of short films and so we started talking about doing well what if we did a, ver a sort of southern version of that and so we came up with this idea of the show called the dirty south when we would just do either three or four sort of short films in half an hour and so and I think we ended up we wrote about eight of them and then we shot um, the Dwight David Honeycutt for Conway School Board uh, which was a little comedy piece and then we shot Spinola Pepper Sauce Company and then right after that was when Rectify got picked up so it sort of never <laughs> yeah yeah all right are we going to st I want to stop with Spanola Pepper Sauce Company because we're going to try to see that right now on our wonderful new equipment. And this is about a five minute um, short film. Take it in, crown jewel of the south. Get out here and get you some of God's precious air. You know, people like to say that Louisiana begins at Lake Providence, Louisiana, but we like to say that Louisiana begins six miles north, Spanola Pepper Sauce Company. 67 acres, 19 different pepper varieties from Ancho to Poblano to Pakistani Reds. Come summer, this will all be pepper. As far as the eye can see, people ask me, what do you do for fun in Lake Providence? Well, on Sunday, for instance, we'll go pick up Mother, go to church, we'll go to Penske's Pecan Market so she can make her almost world famous pecan pie, go over to Mr. Richards and count the corn rows. The boys like to throw rocks at the old grain silo. Maybe go look at the old hand car. Sometimes we go to the seed warehouse. Just your average Sunday. Of course, we've had all kinds of privations, depredations, denigrations here at Spanola. There's a fire in a big barn back in 90. Then the big house burned in 93. Of course, I met Margaret in 97. I like fruit juices, apples orange, pineapple, a mixture thereof, as long as it's not too much pineapple. I don't drink beer. I think it tastes like something you feed a hog. If we leave the house on Sunday night, for instance, take mother home or what have you, we will on occasion encounter a vampire. We wrap ourselves in our garlic stuffed Kalamata olives for protection. Now, if we are forced to engage a vampire, the boys prefer to fling holy water on them while mother and I will simply drive 
a pepper steak into there. Hot. Barbecue sauces, honey mustards, injectable marinades, ready mixes, potato stick. You know, Margaret was just a terrific mother to the boys. She was just as kind and generous a soul as has ever walked God's green earth. I take the boys to the correctional facility sometimes so they can look at the inmates. I position them a safe distance from the razor wire fences so they can yell their taunts. <laughs> they think of the funniest doggone things to say. You know, my sister is the only one who still embraces religion, yet her husband came out to be a homosexual. What do you suppose that means? Sometimes I wonder if I should let my boys go on living in a world like this. You grow numb. I'll take a switchblade knife and I'll press it against my arm and I will open up the blade deep into my flesh just to feel something, anything at all. Maybe we ought to go look at the train again. A vampire cannot seduce a woman, he can only attack her. No one seduced Margaret. That is a fabrication invented by novelists and Hollywood types. It will be a great reckoning. The rivers will run with the red hot blood of the vampires. I tell the boys, if you see her, your mother is not your mother anymore. They understand. We'll do what we must to survive. Maybe we'll go back in there, sidle up to a big old piece of that pecan pie. Some meals you remember. It was a good day though today, wouldn't you say? Indeed. We ought to be fine out here till nightfall. With a vampire's kiss I got a vampire's heart Now I don't roll out of bed Till after dark See my teeth so sharp And my blood so still You know I could drink the world And never get my fill and when I come, I will come on like a dream With the crimson moon shining down upon my devil's ring You see, it ain't my fault that I am this way just a crying in my box for I missed a day Lord, what I would give For just one drop of red Now the dew is on the grass and I am late for bed And when I come I will come on like a dream 
With a crimson moon is shining down upon my devil's ring. Okay, there's a there's a long roll of credits. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I um, forgot how weird that was. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to editorialize here for a minute. I'm supremely jealous of that. I just think it's... <laughs> I, I, uh, I hadn't seen it before, um, before I talked to you, but coming here and that... I, I love it. I think it's hilarious. Um, so... But so it was directed by Ray McKinnon. That was one of the things we couldn't miss in the credits. But so now you have a relationship with Ray McKinnon, and and so this is and so Rectify comes the the Sundance series is y'all are talking about it or he's talking about it or well when um, he had, he sold the script he wrote the script on spec, which means he just you know wrote it and then tried to sell it and uh, AMC bought it. Uh, and then AMC said, we're going to do this. We love this show. And then they said, we're going to do it. We're going to do this, um, uh, the, this Walking Dead thing first, and then <laughs> we're going to do it. Yeah. And then they did The Walking Dead, and it, so many people watched it that they were like, yeah, we're probably not going to do this little show about a guy who was in, on death row for 18 years <laughs> <laughs> anymore. But uh, the same company that owns AMC owns uh, IFC and Sundance, and Sundance was getting into original programming. And at the time, I mean, it, it had been like a three or four year process for Ray. I'd read the pilot and really loved it, and he wanted notes on it. I gave him notes on it. And then, um, so as we were doing this stuff, we also wrote a half hour comedy together during that process, and then all of a sudden, uh, Rectify was going, and uh, you know, it was going to be a six-episode first season, and they wanted him to hire a couple other writers, and they and he hired um, uh, this guy Evan Dunsky, who created Nurse Jackie, and then he got my friend Michael and I had written a, sh a show called The Wreck, which was set in the world of college football, and we'd sold it to AMC, and it was our sample, so he actually sort of got two for the price of one <laughs> there. So yeah, so we, we joined the Rectify room and we're, we're part of that um, early season. Um, yeah, maybe you can just explain just really briefly what Rectify was, what it was about. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think Ray was pretty influenced by the West Memphis Three and it's, it's essentially about, um, you know, this man who, when we meet him, is, uh, you know, in his mid to late 30s. He's been on death row for 18 years. He was convicted of murder, in, of murdering this girl when he was 18. And he spent the same amount of time of his life out in the real world and then in, on death row. And then he is um, uh, released on exculpatory DNA evidence and, and sort of returns back to this small community uh, where he grew up and, you know, with his family. And it's just about him kind of reassimilating back into life. And, um, yeah, it's a really sort of small, lilting little show. Uh, and, you know, I was really honored to to be a part of it okay um i'm gonna uh, i would i'd love to talk to you a little bit more about that but let me let me talk about Corey. um so um so how did uh, how did Corey come about how did we get to well when um when i was when when my friend michael and i were in the um uh, Rect uh, rectify room, I was in LA and I was staying with him. And so uh, we were in the writer's room for, you know, a few months and I mean, uh, about two and a half months. And while I was there, we were sort of working on, we'd sold this show, The Wreck, to AMC, which was, you know, they sort of did the same thing to us that they did to Ray, where they said, this is our next show. And then they said, it's not our next show. So, um, so because we'd, we'd sold something together and now we were on the staff together, they said, you know, our representatives were saying, you guys should do something else together. So we started talking about what to do. And we wanted to do some, we're, he's from South Carolina, I'm from Arkansas, we wanted to do something set in the South. We were both really intrigued by the 70s. Um, 
uh, in the South. Uh, we started doing some research in terms of kind of Dixie Mafia at the time. This was pre-justified and all that. And then, um, and then we found a series of books uh, by the writer Max Allen Collins, who wrote *Road to Perdition*, and um, he wrote this series of books since starting in 1975 up until the, the present uh, about a a guy who returns home from Vietnam and is sort of pulled into this world of of criminality and and becomes a hitman. And so um, we we sort of took a lot of the ideas that we had about what we wanted to write about and kind of adapted that. I mean, because we talked to Max and he was very open to <laughs> however we wanted to adapt it, which was great. And so, um, so yeah, we sort of, we ended up kind of writing the first season is really kind of the creation story of, of how this guy got to be the guy you meet in the novels ultimately. But um, yeah, so that, so, so we, we wrote it, we sold the, the pilot to HBO and HBO owns Cinemax and initially they said you can either be in development at HBO or we will shoot the pilot if you if you're willing to put it on Cinemax because they were trying to legitimize you know Cinemax at the time and um, and so we we went for that because the road is paved with people who have development deals at HBO that don't ever get anything on the air. And so um, so we shot the pilot, and this was I think three and a half years ago, maybe that we shot the pilot. Yeah. All right, let me. Um, yeah. Why don't we Why don't we show the trailer of Corey, and then I'll we, we'll um, continue. Just yeah. 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 So you um, you're listed as co-creator and executive producer, and that intrigues me because you know I think everybody knows what a writer does, and I think even people know what. But, uh, but what is what does all executive producing entail? What does that include? Well, I mean, th that title. I mean, I guess like like just the term producer can mean a lot of different things. I mean, sometimes it's it's. Um, it's someone that that is with the production company, and they came to set once. <laughs> you know, yeah, that, yeah. That the guy that owns the production yeah, company. The, yeah, so it's just but a, it, a but, title and name only. Right. Yeah. But in in um, in terms of being the the they they sort of they give you that to to pay you as a producer, basically, in addition to being a writer, so that you'll be on set for the entire process. And so because in in feature films, in at least the history of feature films, the the director has always been king, where you'll sell a script and and your role as writer kind of depends a little bit on your how good your relationship is with the director or not. <laughs> and you know, how much you're deferred to and all that sort of thing. But with TV, because uh, you know, you're talking about, you know, like our first season is eight hours, you know, uh, or eight, eight episodes, and or you know, some of them are ten, some of them are thirteen. Uh, network shows can be twenty-two or twenty-four. Then you're talking about, you know, the creator needs to be there because to work with the director to say, hey, I need you to get an insert shot of this because this prop is this bottle of water is going to pay off in episode five of season two, you know. So that's. Um, you know that that's that's part of part of that, but it's you know it's, I don't know as a title it can mean a lot of different things. Well, that I guess that's the other question too because 
going from a going from a playwright and then going to write a feature length screenplay that's screenplays are what 120 pages i mean that's that's a, a rough estimate but then to write 8 hours of a of a show and also keep that whole world in your head that's that's a that's a different trick isn't it i mean that's a different skill set yeah it gets overwhelming and it it's a little bit um I mean, I think that I've, I'm, I'm gradually sort of acclimating my way to, to do that just in terms of starting to think about something. Because like for instance, when you go in, if you're pitching a feature film, you're, you, you're pitching the story, you're pitching this is 90 to 120 minutes and here's what happens in this and this is why you need to buy this or produce this or whatever. And when you go in and pitch a TV show, you're really pitching the characters and you're really pitching the main character and you're really pitching that arc of what that character does. So when David Chase went in and was pitching The Sopranos, he, t he wanted to talk about how fascinating Tony Soprano was going to be over 50 or 60 or 70 hours that you're going to watch him or Don Draper or Walter White or any of the people that you know we know from the TV shows that, that we see. So. Um, and you know, you eventually have to tell them exactly <laughs> what you're going to do right. and, and how you're going to get there and all that sort of thing. But but really, that that's what you're selling them on. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I think maybe maybe now we can uh, sort of open it up to questions. I'm sure some people have them. Um, I I have my handy dandy stack of note cards here, and there's some questions I didn't get a chance to get to, but I don't want to. We'll. Uh, I don't want to trap you here forever. So we're going to try to get a microphone down. It's actually kind of a little bit hard for us to see, but if you just sort of raise your hand, and um, I think Logan over there is raising his hand. Could you? Hi. Hi. Could you, um, you talked about, you know, selling shows and when you went to sell Quarry, what was that experience like, like walking into the room and hearing these execs and boom, what are you feeling? Uh, I, I mean, you, the, yeah, the, the first couple of times I, I tried to do such a thing, it's pretty, it's pretty terrifying. Um, and it, you know, I think it's just, uh, the process is really just trying to out out prepare everybody else <laughs> because they you know they may they may ask you know sometimes they'll they're sometimes those meetings get so tangential you know like when we went in for this it turned out the initially we went into HBO and they had a whole set of questions about like um, you know what the first season would be and where do you see this like where do you see this guy in season five and you know things like that and then you know we went into the meeting with Cinemax and they one of the executives there was a huge fan of, of like soul you know 70s soul music and because our show was set in like we spent 30 minutes talking about like 70 soul music. So it, you know, it just depends on what, on, on the audience there. But it's really, um, as the sort of market gets more and more competitive, then it really is just about being so, so prepared to sort of show them and tell them exactly what the show is and why you're you're selling your passion as much as I mean it still has to be a a um, a compelling you know piece for them that fits into whatever box like you wouldn't be in the room if 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 it's not something that they when they hear the log line or what it's about or whatever that they're potentially interested in so a lot of those meetings are telling or showing them how much you know about this world how pa and how passionate you are about this world so Thank you. yeah absolutely. Uh, when you're creating and developing new characters, is there anything you go to for inspiration typically, as well as is there a framework you tend to set up at all? Uh, a framework for the characters or? Yeah, for the characters. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that if it's, if it's for a, I think it just depends on how, how large or small the, the character is going to be. I mean, you know, I, it, they're, they're all the, 
the kind of exercises that you can do to sort of create the backstory and stuff like that. And sometimes, I mean, I, I always sort of go through that process of answering those questions of, you know, psychologically who this person is. And, and then sometimes you get into actually writing the dialogue of the character and you're like, that contradicts what I'd written before, but it's a lot more interesting than what I wrote <laughs> in terms of being a biography. So I think that, um, um, there's, but you, you were, and you were telling me that for this one series that you had, you had to do, you're, you have to do a, quite a bit of research on the era. Right. One, because you were born in 1975 and right. set. It is the first episode in 72. 72, okay. yeah. The first season is. So, yeah, I mean, that was a lot of it was just being interested in that time period, being interested in, you know, what is it, what, what would it be like to be a guy returning home from Vietnam that's, to the south that's being ostracized for his involvement there you know where he is emotionally and and all that and then um uh yeah i mean so so it it, it ju and then and then sort of looking at the characters that you create in aggregate and sort of saying all right we have this ensemble like what do we need here and sometimes it's like my god we need when you're dealing with material like this it's like man we could really use a laugh <laughs> We could really use, you know. So how how can we how can we lighten this up and and create a, a a Joker, you know, somewhere along here, you know, things like that. So I think it's just um, going through that. And then sometimes, you know, as you're going through that process, you you get there and you 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 write a a pilot episode and it's 75 pages long and you're like, I thought we were going to have that character and we're not. <laughs> you know, we have to cut out that storyline. So, you know, there's those things that happen too. But but all those things come back around, you know, always end up reusing th those things later. Hello. Hey. Uh, well, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, David. I am... Um, want to get into like film uh, film and stuff stuff that's basically media digital media whether it's film music or whatever i used to be into um writing i kind of still want to be but i've been doing like for the past few years more so photography or filmography uh but i want to get back into that kind of writing mindset or landscape because what i used to do was like write when i felt bad or write when i felt something it, it was basically like troubled youth kind of thing for me so it was like writing to write. get better yeah. <laughs> so uh for for all the stuff that you wrote what kind of struck a chord for like certain things you end up like ever like getting produced into something yeah i mean i i think the the main thing is to try to because it it i mean it again it again gets back to this sort of art versus commerce and you know our, can you can you take the those those moments when you are writing because you're an angsty youth <laughs> or you're just having a tough time or you're journaling or you're doing whatever and how can i you know turn this into something that is um that is still true to what I'm feeling and what I want to write about and what I want to explore about myself and the world and then also make that commodifiable in in any way you know I, the, how, what in is there a box that I can put this in that whether it's going to be a 180 million dollar movie that's going to be in every movie theater across you know the globe or is it going to be a play that's you know in a black box theater for for 50 people um and just kind of figuring out like which one of those things which one of those things you know that is and and just and really i mean i i turned 40 in november and it's i feel like i'm finally getting a grasp of of the forms dramatically you know i feel like if you ask me to write a feature film or a half hour or an hour drama like i now know how to sit down and do that just now <laughs> so i think that um you know a lot of it is just about learning the craft and figuring out but and and i think it's also you know it, a lot of the sort of lean times that i was talking about before was that was having these things that i wanted to to say and write about and not finding the right way to get those out there in order to sell them but again like that's the question is do you want to do do you want to write or do you want to write for a living and i think that that's um 
uh, I, you know, it's a it's a really tough it's a really tough decision to make, and and I st I still go through it because I. You know, I've I've been sort of kind of waiting for the release date on this, and you know, see if we get a second season or whatever. And so, for a couple of months now, I've been at home writing stuff that will probably never sell, <laughs> to, you know, to anybody. But it's stuff that I feel like I need to write right now. So, um, you know, it's just it's just about finding that form. And if if you if you want to if you want to write or if you want to do it for a living, because there are a lot of concessions that have to be made whenever you put it out into the marketplace as a commodity. So. I, I get a, just a real quick question. Um, yeah. The writing process, I understand, lots of people put paper, you know, put words to paper, and depending on their mood or or what's going on in their lives or what they got in there for a creative idea. What's the editing process after you do that? Um, if, for something that's an episode of that you're going to sell or a feature film that you're going to sell, who looks at it after you write it? I mean, it can't be perfect. I would assume that you're looking at it critically at some point. Right. Um, I mean, for me, it's uh, it's probably my wife first, <laughs> and then you know a group of uh, three or four f friends that are writers that I trust a lot that can that will be honest, you know, really honest with me about it. And then once I sort of do a revision based on that, and I feel like it's working and as as tight as it can be, you know, then I will um, I may give it to. Uh, I have a, a good friend of mine who's a who's a producer, and he will kind of say, "All right, well, you know, yes, it's great. Let's try to go out with it. Let's, these are the places that we can, you know, go with it to to try to sell it." Or, you know, he might say, "Yeah, I don't know." I don't know that there's any place for this right now. You know, I mean, that that seems to be there, there's a, a lot of that right now. Sort of where um, I mean, on the one hand, in terms of television, like it is, there is a boom. It may be a, a bubble, <laughs> by the way, because you know, I, mean, I just remember rushing home on Sunday nights to watch, uh, you know, Mad Men and Breaking Bad, and now it's like there are ten shows on my DVR that I will that are great and worth my time and I will probably never watch them. There's just a glut of really great entertainment out there. So there, there are, there are places to take things, but, um, uh, anyway, sorry to answer your question. It, it really kind of just goes through that, that stage of, 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 you know, just people I trust around me and then, and then starting to give it to, you know, agent and, and producers that I know and things like that to see what we would do with it. And maybe uh, one or two more questions. Yes. How do you feel about places like Netflix that do the whole season all at once instead of having to wait? Is that something that you kind of want to shoot for or do you want to just do the one episode a week kind of thing. I I would always prefer to do one episode a week, and um, I I think that we're probably generally I don't know maybe I I don't know how it's gonna work. I'm assuming that in five years that everything is going to be sort of dropped at once everywhere that you go because you're going to be getting all of your entertainment through you know your HBO app or your Hulu app or your Netflix app and so but I am a big fan I think of of the the water cooler conversation and just the cultural conversation that goes on um, on the Monday mornings after I, I, that's my favorite part of being a fan of those things. So on, on Netflix, if it's like House of Cards or Orange is the New Black or you know one of those shows, you, you talk to somebody about it and they're like, I'm only on episode five of season uh, two, you know, and, and so it's, the, it's harder to have that. The, the, yeah, the, the entire thing that's built up around the spoiler alert, you right. know, uh, <laughs> conversation. Right. That's it, really, yeah. And yeah. so like even in your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed or whatever, you're sort of avoiding, I don't want to know what happened happened on Game of Thrones last night. You know, like Game of Thrones is one that it feels like there's still a cultural conversation that happens the Monday after that. And I think that that is, and I think that 
honestly, I think that part of the reason that the first season of True Detective was really successful, I, I feel like those first four or five episodes were a lot stronger than like the last few. And I think that it had garnered so much attention and so much talk that it was like, that, that you know, people were, it, it was just, people were so excited that, you know, that it was, that it was going on. And so um, I think that that always benefits the show, but that's, yeah, that's me. Thank you to Matt Chase for, uh, yes, with you. the, with the microphone. <laughs> yes. I've never really been a writer myself, but writers are always interesting people when I meet them. But, um, you seem like you write a lot of stuff in the South because it seems like maybe that's what you know. Um, like, how hard is it to, like, especially like Corey and stuff, to like immerse yourself in a world like that for so long and then have to deal with outside world? Like, did your education and philosophy like help you to like cope with the world? I mean, I'm sorry if that's like a too personal of a question, <laughs> but it's just like that's really interesting to me to like be, like you having to separate like your your real life from that life and like how introverted does like it make you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think that the, I think the, the key for me is not to do it more than, you know, six or seven hours a day. <laughs> Cause I think that you can, I mean, I was telling Warner before we started that I, I, if I'm being honest with myself, like I probably did get into writing in order to read because I enjoy, I really, and I avoid, I mean, my procrastination involves researching too much. So I get really, and so I, I enjoy that a lot. And um, I, so, so I can get sort of bogged down in that a little too much. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I mean, in terms of the philosophy aspect of things, I think, you know, the, or just in general, if you are embarking on a career of, of writing and you are trying to hold a mirror up to the world, I mean, your, your subject matter isn't chemistry. It isn't, you know, it's the world. <laughs> so you get to know about whatever, whatever it is that's, that's fascinating you at that, at that moment. And so, um, that's great. And, and sometimes the things that I'm really passionate about or fascinated with or can go down a rabbit hole in terms of researching for six months, uh, like a lot of people have no interest in whatsoever. <laughs> and then other times, you know, it's like, okay, well, that, hit, you know, that hits a chord. Um, you know, it's interesting that you're talking about that because I always, it always fascinates me about when talking to writers, people that write a lot like you and that, what what do you think is the is the most basic trait that you have that you feel like lends itself to you doing what you do? I mean, what what is it that that you possess that you think makes it at least this writing possible? Um, man, that's a really good question that I'm not sure that I know the. I'll should talk to my therapist about and figure out. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I think that it is. I think that. Two things. One, I think that early on in my life, in terms of wanting to be an actor and wanting to like entertain and get people's attention, <laughs> that that's as, that's that's an aspect of it, and that sort of synth synthesized later on with a genuine interest in. I mean, just the the. I was listening to an interview with Tony Hoagland, who's a poet that I absolutely love. Well, that's, oh, okay, I, I want you to continue. But if you don't, if you get a chance, go look at Graham Gordy's Facebook page, if only for the very reason you can read lots of great poetry, <laughs> because Graham b b posts the greatest poems. Okay, I'm sorry, continue. Well, uh, I mean, poetry is something that I feel like I, I, have, I can read and really enjoy because I have no interest or no aptitude towards writing, so it can just, it's pure pleasure for me. But I was listening to an interview with Tony Hoagland, and he said, they said, you know, he said, what is, what is your desire, like, what, what is it that you want people to feel when you write a poem? And he said, well, the first thing is, isn't that clever? <laughs> and I was like, man, that's a really honest answer. Like, and ultimately, that is the first stage of it. It's like, and, and part of that is, is I, I know I've, I've sort of framed it in a negative way before in terms of the industry and having to sort of... Uh, 
put things into a certain box so that people, you know, it'll appeal to people. But part of it is like, look, look at this, you know, to, to make an audience feel like they are in good hands, you know. And I think, so there's, there's, then that they're going to be entertained. I think that that's part of it. And then I also think that, um, just kind of immersing, I think just just curiosity, I think that that's, that's the other aspect of it that probably I didn't have as a younger <laughs> a younger self, just with that straight desire to kind of entertain and then those two things, you know, combined and that's when I was like, okay, I might actually be a writer. Um, okay, wait, one, one more question. Yeah, she can... <laughs> If it were your choice, would you choose the feature films or would you choose the network series, and which of those are easier to break into, and why? Um, I think they. I mean, they both have their their benefits and their drawbacks. I don't mean to, you know, uh, uh, I. Th there's something. There's something. I, I watched so many movies growing up, and there wasn't, I mean, we, we weren't in the golden age of television when I was growing up, so I was, you know, watching, I don't know, I don't know, I was watching really terrible television. But, um, and so, so I think that I always, if, if there was any aspiration there, it was to write feature films. But feature films have generally changed. I mean, they really, um, Studios are making fewer and fewer movies, and they are making it because when I was growing up, we didn't have 60 inch televisions at our houses that make us not want to leave our houses. <laughs> you know, and so the studios know that movies are event films and they are to be attracting people from 14 to 25 years old and so that's what almost every movie throughout the year is is made for and then you get this sort of group of you know 20 or so films that is made, that comes out in November and December that's sort of part of the Oscars race and so um, I mean if I had my druthers like I would probably love to to write those smaller films that are made <laughs> that come out towards the end of the year because um, that would also afford me the opportunity to be in Arkansas a lot more I can I could do that a lot more here and wouldn't have to travel nearly as much um, but but TV also offers a you know a great uh, you know the, the the sort of cliche about the wire is that it it's a Dickensian novel, you know, it's just put out in these these sections, <laughs> uh, and and there's and you get to explore characters in in a way that you would never get to. In I mean, how much better do you know Tony Soprano and Don Draper, and you know, than you do the greatest, even the greatest characters in feature films. So there there's real benefit to that too. So. Um, that's a, to a totally waffling answer, but I, it is genuine. Like I do, I think they both have you know benefits and drawbacks. Do you outline? I do, yeah, yeah, and um, I find it pretty, n pretty necessary. I mean, I, I think that the the key to my outlining seems to be, like, if I'm on page five, I want to know what happens on page thirty, but. If I get to page 30 and it's exactly the way I got, I thought I was going to get there, it's probably wrong. <laughs> like if, like there should be invention along the way. Yeah, you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that seems real to me. This idea that, and that because people ask me, do I outline, and I don't, and but because I, I want the surprise of getting there, and but that, and I think you know that that seems to be like, you know, that's a. Because otherwise, if you're not surprising yourself, then then yeah. How well, a lot of the times, the sh you know the sh and this sounds somehow mystical or something, but like the 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 movie or the TV show is like telling you what it is. You know that you you're just more drawn to certain characters than you are to others. You're more, you know, and all of a sudden it's it's. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a. A character on on Corey, sort of one of the other hitmen that was like a, a 
pretty minor character in the pilot, and then you know he, he and his mom somehow became like my favorite things to write in the entire thing. And part of it was that it was it is more sort of the more comic relief aspect of it, but it's. Um, yeah, it, sometimes those things kind of take over. So, yeah, I, I think outlining is really helpful, but I also also thoroughly encourage moving away from the outline as you go. So. Um, I want to uh, thank Graham Gordy again for being here. Thank you all for, for coming out tonight, and uh, we sure uh, appreciate it, and stay tuned for the next event, which may be fall of 2016. We'll see. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you, guys.